Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Adam Levine, and I'm executive director here at the New York Metropolitan Transportation Council, or NIMTEC. As a downstate region's metropolitan planning organization, NIMTEC provides a collaborative planning forum to address transportation related issues and develop regional plans through its members' shared vision for the transportation network that connects New York City, Long Island, and the lower Hudson Valley. I thank you all for participating in today's brown bag. Please note that this webinar is eligible for one certification maintenance credit from the American Planning Association. You will find more information about this in the chat. Today, we have presentations from four organizations that are key to the success of the New York State Electric Vehicle Initiative through their work to ensure grid readiness and infrastructure resiliency. Before I introduce our expert panel, I want to briefly share some of the work we at NIMTEC have done in this space for the benefit of the metropolitan region and our members to help drive a greener future. As you well, as you will see on the screen, um, uh, NIMTEC has had several efforts underway to help move towards electrification. Some of these include programming federal NEVI funding, National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Funding for Charging Infrastructure, Clean Freight Corridors Planning Study and Implementation, a Continued Purchase of Electric Transit Buses and Supporting Infrastructure, New York City Clean Trucks Program, U.S. Department of Energy's Clean Cities Program, and Partnering in Electric Transportation Workshops for Local Fleet Owners and Funding for Conversions. So now let's hear from our fabulous panelists. Our first presentation will be by Adam Ruder, Ruder, Director of Clean Transportation for the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, or NYSERDA. He'll be followed by John Markowitz, Senior Director of E-Mobility for the New York Power Authority. We will then hear from Brian Grimaldi, Vice President of Corporate Affairs for National Grid. And lastly, we will hear from Jen Hensley, Senior Vice President of Corporate Affairs for Con Edison. There will be an opportunity for questions following the presentation, so please type your questions into the WebEx chat box, and we will address them during the Q&A portion towards the end. I will also ask that you let us know via the chat who you are and where you're joining us from. This helps us learn so much more about our audiences, and we really appreciate you sharing that information. Lastly, I want to let you know we have two additional brown bags coming up in the next couple of months, so please mark your calendars. On Thursday, May 16th at noon, we'll be hearing from the City of Hoboken on its Vision Zero initiative. And on Wednesday, June 12th at noon, the Lehigh Valley Planning Commission will be presenting on the evolving mega region, revisioning freight development and mobility in eastern Pennsylvania. More info on these will be forthcoming. I'll now turn it over to Adam Ruder. Adam? Thank you, Adam. Uh, always a pleasure to be with uh, with our friends here at NIMTIC. And, uh, and thank you for the invitation and, and thank you to my uh, fellow panelists today. I am going to be um, giving a quick uh, overview of uh, transportation electrification uh, in the area and uh, and more broadly what we're doing statewide uh, before uh, you all hear from from the other panelists in a little bit more detail on some of um, some of their experience with uh, the interactions between transportation and the electric grid and uh, and. Um, I'm happy to speak to that uh, during the um, during the uh, Q and A. Um, so, um, as Adam said, uh, I am the clean, uh, the director for clean transportation at the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, and um, New York State has set some uh, really ambitious uh, goals for climate uh, for our you know our response to climate change and um you know this includes both economy wide goals um that are set by the Clim climate leadership and community protection act um but also a lot of transportation sector impl implications for these uh goals um while there aren't specific uh goals in the legislation for the transportation sector um the transportation sector was neck and neck with the buildings, uh, with buildings in New York State as the uh, the leading sources of greenhouse gas emissions, about thirty percent each. Um, and so we need to make a lot of progress. And uh, and you know the modeling, all the modeling that we've done, and and um, certainly everything that I think you've you've heard um, 
you know, from, from all aspects of the, of the industry and, and from uh, modelers like this are that um, is that, you know, electrification is going to be a big part of this. Um, not the only part and a lot of the other work that NIMTIC is involved with um, in reducing, you know, vehicle miles traveled and, and, you know, promoting alternative modes of transportation is a big part of this. But, you know, when we talk about electrification, we're talking about, you know, three, two to three million light duty EVs on the road by 2030, um, which is not very far off. We um, don't have a, a long, uh, a, a lot, a lot of time to achieve that as well as 80,000 or more uh, medium and heavy duty uh, EVs by, by that time frame. Um, and while we're making a lot of progress, um, you know, we have a long way to go. Um, sales of EVs in New York State in 2023 uh, were up 80% over uh, the previous record setting year of the, of the year before. Um, and, um, we have a, more and more models every year available, um, in the NIMTIC area, um, where that's really the hotbed of EV activity in the state. And, um, you know, as, as you can see on the last slide, about 136,000 EVs are on the road as of, um, as of March 1st in the NIMTIC area. Um, and again, this is in the New York state portion of the New York metro area. There are a lot more in New Jersey. And if you add in New Jersey and Connecticut as well, um, and many of those are traveling in and about, uh, the, the area as well. Um, that's out of about 210,000 in statewide. So a significant portion, you know, 65% of them, the, the EVs in the state are in this area. Um, of those about 40, a little more than 40% are Tesla's, um, which is a pretty significant portion. Um, but the number of non Tesla models are growing. Um, and, you know, we have, we have accelerated the market adoption, uh, significantly in that, um, in this area, more than 12% of the new cars, um, uh, that were purchased in the last six months um were evs um that's pretty significant it's not california numbers uh which are about double that but it is higher than the rest of the state and uh and higher than the national average um you know this map here is a zip code by zip code um you know uh breakdown of where the evs are in our in the uh in the state and in the area um, all this data comes from our Evaluate New York um, website, which is publicly accessible. Um, you'll see a few hot spots um, in some of the places you might expect in some of the uh, areas of Westchester and Long Island that you might expect. There's this one little uh, very uh, dark dot that I think uh, makes all the rest of the shading a little bit um, uh, homogenous. I think that that's where the New York City, that's the address where the New York City fleet is um, uh, registered to because there were over 7,000 EVs in that one little, um, uh, in that one little uh, triangle, uh, according to the data. So I'm guessing that that's where New York City um, fleet is registered. Um, public charging is obviously, uh, you know, another critical element of the proliferation of, um, of EVs. And, um, you'll note that, um, while about 65% of the EVs in the state are in this area, only about 37% of the public charging is in this area. Um, so there's actually a lot less charging, uh, than, uh, than, than per EV than there is in the rest of the state and in, in this area. Most of the chargers, which is true everywhere, are level two chargers, which are the type of charger that you would use to charge for um, and get about 20 to 40 miles of range in an hour. Um, best types of locations for those are workplaces, you know, theaters, homes, uh, the types of places that you might stay for a few hours. Um, there is a growing number of fast chargers, although most of the fast chargers in this area and, and statewide are, are the Tesla connectors. Um, 
which is uh, frankly the direction that most of the industry is moving um, going forward. And uh, you'll see that the color coded, um, you know, the color coded uh, dots on the map reflect the Tesla chargers versus um, the blue and green are are the other main types of chargers. Um, some of those Tesla chargers are level two. Some of them are fast chargers. They're not. Th those are not all fast chargers. Um, New York State is already doing quite um, uh, quite a bit to advance EVs. Uh, this includes regulations like um, adopting uh, California's Advanced Clean Cars Two and Advanced Clean Trucks regulations, which are uh, even more aggressive than the EPA regulations that were announced the last few weeks um, in uh, requiring uh, truck and bus uh, zero emission vehicle purchases. Um, and then we have <clears throat> we have rebates as well. Our drive clean rebate for light duty vehicles offers up to two thousand dollars, and our truck voucher incentive program will cover um, up to one hundred percent of the difference in cost between the diesel. Uh, the truck or bus and an equivalent electric one. And I'll talk more about buses in just a moment, which are a, a spe special focus of ours right now. Um, we have a number of charging programs as well, uh, you know, both through the utilities, and I know you'll hear more about those and today, as well as through the New York Power Authority, and, and you'll hear more about that today as well. Um, but then, um, the uh, NEVI program, the National EV Infrastructure Program, which Adam uh, referenced earlier, infuses $175 million uh, to the state for uh, build out of more fast chargers in particular along major highways, um, as well as potentially other types of locations. Um, NYSERDA has focused on level two charging as well as uh, some DC fast charging in some upstate areas that really have had, have had very little. Um, their municipal grants through the Department of Environmental Conservation, and uh, and then also uh, state and federal tax credits um, that can that can help reduce the cost of these. So we're really uh, trying on a number of different fronts to expand EV uh, charging infrastructure, which we see as crucial to the continued expansion of of EV adoption. Uh, I did want to touch for a moment on electric school buses, which are a, as I said, a particular focus of ours. Um, New York State has um, one of the most aggressive uh, programs to to convert school buses to zero emission vehicles in the country. Um, by 2027, all school bus purchases are uh, required to be zero emission vehicles, and and by 2035, all school buses in operation in the state uh, must be zero emission. Um, to get there, you know, we have a long way to go, uh, but we are making some strong progress. Um, a year ago, I would I would have, uh, I think there were probably under 10 buses, uh, electric buses on the road. Now uh, we're around 60. Um, New York has been uh, one of the biggest recipients, if not the biggest recipient of EPA uh, funding for school buses, uh, over 300 buses. Uh, receiving more than 125 million dollars from the EPA, um, and uh, we've started to receive uh, applications to our school bus uh, incentive program, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Um, all told, uh, we know that there are about 500 buses um, in the pipeline that will be on the road soon uh, in in the state. So we are making progress. Um, a key element of this is supporting the school districts um, and the school bus operators in uh, getting to the point where they're ready to buy these buses. And so we are offering um, funding for studies uh, for them to um, for them to really figure out what the process looks like. And uh, and we've got over you know over two hundred studies of this out of the seven hundred school districts in the state underway. Um, Including some of the ones that we're coordinating with uh, the kind of uh, regional groups on, we think that we're working with more than half of all the districts in the state already. We have a lot of resources that we've put out there. Um, so we developed a school bus roadmap and a school bus guidebook, electric school bus roadmap and guidebook. Um, the roadmap is more of a policy document, uh, really describing how we think the state is going to achieve these goals. 
And then the guidebook is more hands-on uh, living resources that are going to be updated regularly uh, for fleet owners and uh, partners and, um, you know, that could be the business officials or the transportation officials or the finance, uh, the, the facilities directors or the superintendents or school boards. Um, you know, there's information that all of these uh, folks in the process need to know, and we're trying to answer key questions and, and help people through the process with this guidebook. Um, as I mentioned, we have funding to cover fleet electrification planning, and this is really a comprehensive plan that we're helping schools develop um, and school bus fleets develop um, that will cover up to 100% of the, the uh, cost of these studies uh, to develop a plan, uh, understand what it's going to take to electrify that particular school district. Um, and then we have funding out there that will cover up to 100% of the difference in cost between a gasoline or diesel uh, school bus and an electric bus, as well as the, uh, you know, some or all of the costs of the charging um, associated with that. And uh, this comes out of the $500 million uh, environmental bond act that was passed in 2022, uh, or the $500 million of the $4.2 million bond act. Um, you know, we see a lot of opportunities out there uh, and, and a number of challenges as well for electrifying school buses. And we see this as, as really a, a microcosm of the, the broader uh, market for electrifying um, the transportation sector. Um, you know, with current funding, whether that's um, federal money or state money and the planning support, we see these as attainable. Uh, what we're really encouraging schools to do right now is uh, get started by one or two, uh, see how they work, see how they incorporate into your fleet. And we think that every school district and every school bus operator in the state can be doing that and should be doing that. Um, there are going to be challenges in bringing enough electrical capacity to school bus depots, and, and that's something that um, I know that the utilities who are uh, on this um, webinar today are working on uh, closely. Um, and, you know, there are going to be challenges with the cost of that and, uh, and with, the, with the timeline, but those are solvable problems, we believe. Um, and uh, there is going to be more workforce training needed, uh, but... Uh, the one thing I'll say is that the folks who have experienced these school, electric school buses that are really hands on with them, the mechanics and drivers, um, every one of them that we've talked to has been really enthusiastic. Um, and this includes, you know, the 30 year grizzled, you know, vet of the of the bus garage who who is a gearhead. And, you know, they they are really enthusiastic after they see these buses. Um, but it's not just challenges, it is opportunities, and, and you'll probably hear more about uh, these types of opportunities today as well, um, about, um, you know, savings from operations and maintenance and potential new revenue streams like uh, providing energy back to the grid at times of need. Um, so with that, I will turn it back to Adam, and uh, I'm eager to share more uh, in the Q&A. That was great. Thank you, Adam. That Evaluate NY website is really terrific. I hope folks get a chance to check that out. Uh, and um, our attendees should feel free to start dropping questions in the chat. If you do uh, have some questions for Adam or the other speakers, we'll save them for the end. You don't need to save your questions and type them in at the end. You can type them in right now um, or anytime during the chat. We'd also like to hear from folks where you're from. Thank, thank you to Tess from CRTC for letting us know. Um, anybody else that can also let us know where you're from will be great. And without uh, any further ado, let me jump into our next speaker, who is John Markowitz, Senior Director of E-Mobility for the New York Power Authority. John? Thanks, Adam. Uh, Jay, for inviting me, and I'll get the screen share going. Okay, you should be able to see my screen. Um, so I'll be speaking about our Evolve New York program, which is a EV fast charging program. Um, and before that, I'll give a brief uh, summary of, of uh, who New York Power Authority is. For those who are not familiar, we're the state's largest, we're the largest state-owned electric utility um, in the country. Generate about a quarter of the state's electricity. Most of that's hydroelectric power from upstate. 
uh, we're active in transmission, but not electrical distribution. So even though we serve a lot of the government loads in um, New York City and Westchester, um, that's through Con Ed's distribution grid. And we're also very active in energy efficiency and research. And for years, our e-mobility program, which is o over two decades old, um, lived within our R&D group. And we did a lot of the early pilots with um, our partners at NYSERDA, Department of Energy, and some others. Um, some of the first hybrid transit buses uh, tested in the state. Some of the first large deployments of uh, level two AC charging. Um, in the country, uh, we partnered with, uh, we partnered with Thruway on some of the 1st, uh, DC fast chargers on the highways. And now we've really grown the program to scale and broken out from the R and D group. Um, and we have over 20 people actively managing, uh, electric vehicle charging projects. Uh, 1 part of our program is our customer program, and this is an engineering procurement and construction service. That we offer to our state and local government customers, and then they own the charging equipment after we finish the construction project and they pay us back for that. And we help them find whatever grant funding is available to build this stuff out. And it's all sorts of use cases, all kinds of EV fast charging. So everything from uh, level 2 AC charging all the way to high speed DC fast charging. Everything from workplaces at government office buildings to uh, government fleets, uh, public charging and anything from a commuter lot to DC fast charging on highways and anything from transit bus to school bus charging as well. And we also do feasibility studies for those who want to do long term capital planning to understand exactly how much it'll cost to fully electrify their fleet over a multi year period. And here's an example of a large customer project we're doing. We're working with New York City Transit um, for their transit bus electrification. And here are some uh, construction photos of an active project now. This is uh, Williamsburg Bridge Plaza. And this is an on route uh, high powered uh, bus charger. So this is a 400 kilowatt unit. And you can see from the uh, mast on the left. This is a robotic arm that comes down and mates with the top of the bus. It's called a pantograph charging system. Um, so while the bus driver's on break, uh, they could basically uh, recharge the battery on the bus. And here's a construction photo from one of the bus depots. And you could see there's uh, on the left, uh, a row of these pantograph uh, style chargers mounted to the ceiling of the depot. And on the right are some of the power uh, cabinets uh, that are in the depot. So that just gives some examples of a customer project. But the main presentation I'll make is on Evolve New York, which is our co uh, consumer facing DC fast charging network that we've built out. And it dates back to 2018 when we knew the state climate legislation was coming. Um, but basically most of New York state was a DC fast charging desert outside of Tesla's fast charging network, which at that time was completely proprietary. It only served Tesla's vehicles. So if you own say a Ford or a Chevy EV, you wanted to travel across the state. It was basically impossible. Um, the only DC fast charging in the state was all south of Albany. And, and there was very, few, very little of that to speak of. Um, so we really wanted to solve this problem. We didn't see that the private sector was doing it. So we thought the state had to jump in, um, really be a 1st mover and start building out a map that looked like this. That would be basically the minimum backbone of DC fast charging to stimulate electric vehicle purchases, because we knew people wouldn't buy these cars. If they couldn't use them to visit grandma or go on vacation or something like that, even though they were excellent commuting cars. So the first site we opened was in LaGrangeville, New York, which is on the Taconic Parkway. Um, and, you know, it was unique at the time in that, you know, our vision of, of fast charging was 150 or 350 kilowatts. Um, because we knew all the cars coming out in 2024, 2025 would be supporting that level of charging. Most of the DC fast chargers that were being installed back then were a single 50 kilowatt unit. We didn't think that was fast enough. 
And then we also realize that at peak times, like on, on holiday weekends, if you only have one charger, you're likely to arrive and somebody else is using it and there's a, a prolonged wait time. So we figured like four should be the new standard on these. So that's how we built it out. And here's the governor visiting us at the grand opening. And even to this day, we are the only fast charging on certain roads like the Taconic Parkway um, the Northway on 87, um, going north to Albany, all the way to Quebec. Um, Southern Tier, we're almost exclusive fast charger uh, going on the 1786 corridor. So I think we really were that seed um, going in. Um, just to give you the idea of the layout of the typical site, it starts with a utility owned transformer on a concrete pad, then that would serve the electrical switch gear um that you see that's basically like a, a oversized uh, circuit breaker panel then it goes to those smaller gray cabinets over to the right of that um those are the power cabinets that convert the ac power to dc and the dc power actually charges the vehicle batteries then the row of what people normally call chargers we call dispensers um that's the part the end user interfaces with and as you can see at this site, we have eight chargers. This is in the southern tier, about halfway between the Nimtic region and uh, Binghamton. And we co-located uh, with Tesla because of that proprietary nature on the vehicle connectors. And we shared some of the trenching expense there. Um, in terms of the anatomy of a DC fast charger, it has these large liquid cooled cables. So it was the first device ever that had an electrical cable with a liquid cooled jacket, and that's how you get to these high powered levels, like 350 kilowatts. And it's really necessary to get to those high powered levels to be able to charge up a car to um, a reasonable fraction of full in like 20 minutes and really make road tripping and EVs practical. Um, so you have the liquid cooled cables, you have a touch screen. Um, that the user can interface with um, for making payment and seeing what their state of charge is. Um, all our charges have a credit card reader on them, uh, as well as a tap to pay interface using uh, like a mobile phone. And then also there's a phone app payment uh, mechanism. So there's multiple payment interfaces. Uh, and then also you, there's visibility lighting on all these chargers. So they're fairly tall and they have their own lighting so you could find them in a big parking lot. In terms of programs overall status, we crossed the 100 charger uh, milestone back in 2022. Uh, we're continuing to build out the network through 2025. We're currently at 170 chargers at just over 40 locations. Um, long term goal is to get to over 400 chargers. Um, and our typical sites go anywhere from 2 to 12 chargers at a location. So the 2 charger locations tend to be in downtown revitalization areas. So the idea there is pull people off the interstate, have them visit the local cafes. And that was done in tandem with the state's downtown revitalization initiative program. Um, then some of our larger sites, like the lower right-hand corner here, that's JFK Airport. So that's 10 DC fast chargers. Um, at the time we built it, it was the largest non-Tesla site on the East Coast. We, we only held that distinction for a few months, um, but it's an incredibly busy site. Um, and it's a key part of the electrification of taxis and rideshare fleets in New York. And, and this site is absolutely swamped. If anybody's visited the cell phone lot of JFK, um, at this point, there's a waiting line to use those chargers. And like I said earlier, all our chargers are either 175 or 350 kilowatts to give that um, you know maximum fast charging kind of experience. And we've also teamed up with state DOT to take advantage of the federal um, NEVI infrastructure money. Um, and basically, the idea here was to fill the remaining gaps on the uh, main highway corridor. So. There's roughly 20 um, gaps in the highways to meet the federal minimum standard of having a DC fast charging hub like this every 50 miles along those designated corridors. Um, and you know the way we were building out these sites um, is, is exactly like the federal uh, program's minimum standards for chargers, 150 kilowatts or higher each. Um, that that was our spec from day one. So we sort of um, 
you know, presaged the whole uh, NEVI program. Um, we opened up what was one of the first NEVI sites in the country. It was us in Ohio opening the same week, um, and that site's on Kingston in Kingston. So, um, the, you know, the uh, I guess it's uh, up in Ulster County, on, uh, just off uh, 87. Um, second site we opened uh, that was NEVI funded is Richmondville. That's uh, out by Oneonta on the 88 corridor. And then we just recently opened North Hudson, which is on the North way um, between Albany and Montreal. Um, and then uh, here are some sites in the NIMTIC region. So these are the existing sites. I mentioned JFK, we have Riverhead, Colmac, Bridge Hampton, so out in Long Island, Golden's Bridge uh, in Westchester, and then also Copeg, Long Island. Uh, then we have uh, some additional sites that are in development. These are all either in design or construction. Uh, so Stony Point, East Hampton, uh, LaGuardia Airport will be our largest. That'll be a 12 charger site. Uh, Katona, Southfold, and downtown White Plains. And then there's a whole group of sites we're building out in the NIMTIC region in partnership with New York City DOT. Um, they have some very aggressive goals to electrify the uh, municipal parking lots that uh, they have about 6,000 parking spaces under their management. Um, so we're working on 13 locations with them all in the outer boroughs. And each of these will have an evolved fast charging hub that will be uh, in addition to the fast charging that New York City DOT already owns and operates. And just a picture of some of our typical sites upstate. We've done a lot of them at convenience stores like Stewart's and Maravitos. Um, and uh, and then the one in the lower um, left hand corner is one of those downtown revitalization sites where you see just two chargers. But like I said, typically they're four or six per site. And, uh, you know, looking forward to the uh, question and answer uh, section at the end. Thanks. Great. Thank you, John. I'm, I'm uh, comforted to know that Flavor the Cow can get her car charged at a steward's as needed. That is awesome. Thank you for sharing that picture. That was great. Uh, let's hear from uh, Brian Grimaldi next, Vice President of Corporate Affairs for National Grid. Brian. Thank you, Adam. Thanks to the Metropolitan Transportation Council for hosting and having us. I'm going to share my screen now. Can you all see that? Yes. yes. Awesome. So National Grid um, is in the process of building smarter, stronger, cleaner, more equitable energy systems throughout the city. Um, for those of you who may not necessarily be familiar with National Grid, we run service territories from Buffalo to Montauk and in different places in the state, we serve different things. But in the, the upstate regions, which is the capital region in Albany, Central New York, in and around Syracuse, and around Western New York, um, we have a mix of um, large scale electrical networks um, that we are ever improving to handle the electrification needs of the state um, based on the scoping plan and the climate law. So, let's see. So, you know, we're on our way to achieving the state's ambitious climate goals and targets, um, and it's an ongoing success story, but it's already underway. Um, that said, there's a ton left to do, and we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, the grid to handle the electrification of transportation needs to grow um, by an order of magnitude of uh, one or two um, to be able to handle the rising demand of the future projected need. Um, that means expanding and upgrading electric networks um, at significant pal and scale, uh, uh, pace and scale um, in, in collaboration with our key stakeholders, our customers, and the communities that we serve. I'll give you a window into what that looks like in upstate New York in a minute. Um, but, you know, future forward, you know, we are transforming our capabilities. We're creating the network that is essentially smarter, stronger, and cleaner to be able to meet the state's goals of 70% renewable energy by 2030, 100% um, zero emission electricity by 2040, um, developing new electrified end use technologies and clean resources, and providing a more individualized, seamless experience for our customers along the way. Um, 
We, about two years ago, issued a clean energy vision. Uh, at the heart of that is affordability and customer choice, uh, reducing costs, maintaining affordability, um, and working through the energy efficiency and demand response programs that we have in place and have been successful to date. Advancing smart electrification to build that network um, to be able to handle our anticip anticipated loads and then decarbonizing the energy systems to be able to do that. Um, and for those of you who may not be familiar, National Grid has a renewables arm, um, includes National Grid Ventures. Uh, we have a parcel in the bite auction and a contract with NYSERDA to provide 1.3 gigawatts of offshore wind power um, into the grid um, later this decade. So we're looking forward to that. Um, in the meantime, you know, we have this huge opportunity to electrify New York State's highway network. And because New York wants to lead in the transportation of electrification, and the state's established these goals to reduce tailpipe emissions by electrifying not only light duty vehicles, but also commercial trucks, um, highway fast charging is critical to enable this. Um, so with federal support, um, we are enabling that now. Uh, we've been the subject of a number of studies um, that we've led with CalSTART and RMI. Um, the first um, did a uh, medium and light duty uh, analysis for the state of New York, and that got morphed into using IAJA funding uh, for a $50 million grant to study um, uh, work in, uh, across the Northeast and we're working through that now. So the highway sites are going to require huge amounts of electricity to power all the fast chargers that you just heard about from John. And some of these sites will use incredible amounts of power. If you're talking about charging large semi trucks, um, you're talking about a, the order of a magnitude of you know the size of electricity for things like sports stadiums and small towns. Um, so building that means being able to plug them in to the state's transmission system in an effective way. And the good news there is most of the throughway system runs adjacent to National Grid's transmission network in upstate New York. So we have a huge window of opportunity. Uh, we're looking at this now, thinking through the permitting, thinking through what we need to get it done. I know because large scale transmission projects takes, take generally between four and eight years to build. Uh, to enable the state's 2030 goals, we have a project under flight now we'll talk about in a minute uh, that will, in the next now 66 months, um, get us to meet those 2030 goals. Uh, but one of the important things that's happening as we speak um, is the governor's proposed the Rapid Act in the New York State budget that will speed up the permitting process to enable this and the electrification uh, needs of the future as we start to tackle not just decarbonization of transportation, but also decarbonization of heat. So our transmission upgrades are, are set to enable our 2030 goals. We've got about 1,000 miles of upgrades happening. Roughly 600 of them are on existing rights of way. And that's good news because we already have the land rights to be able to use that. There are some instances where we have to expand uh, minimum distances, but for the most part, because they're already there, it makes it quite easy to expand within that network. Um, that's not to take away from the huge construction projects that are necessary to be able to enable that, but we're talking roughly 70 projects over the course of the next 66 months, we're talking about mobilizing 800 workers. We're talking about you know, multiple Article 7 proceedings through the Public Service Commission to get the permitting in place and, and dealing with you know, the communities that we're going to be affecting during these timelines. Uh, working with our landowners to talk about land impacts and, and working across the entire service territory. So we're very excited about that. Um, and in terms of anticipating the need, the need, our current project is called the Upstate Upgrade. Uh, we're all familiar with under the climate law what the state has set out to build, right? Nine gigawatts um, installed offshore wind, 16 gigawatts of onshore solar and wind, and six gigawatts of storage. Uh, this is to enable the envisioned 1.5 million electric vehicles that will be roaming the state um, between now and 2035. At the same time, we're electrifying a ton of heat in the process. So we talked a minute ago about the 600 miles of transmission lines that's in our existing right-of-ways, um, and that's adding significant tower and substation upgrades on the order of about 45 either new or upgraded substations between now and 2030. So we're moving from the present 
limited electric vehicle charging, heavy reliance on fossil fuel model to one that is more empowered of the future. And I know this is a little tough to see, so I'll toggle between these two screens and you can see the infrastructure that gets built to enable the scale at which we're, we're discussing it. And I'll point out a few things that are on this second slide. Um, if you look here, you know, we just heard about fleet electrification of school buses. Um, we also have fleet electrification of public transportation um, in National Grid's upstate region, the Capital District Transit Authority is part of our service territory. Um, electrification of parking lots um, and then airports and um, ports as well. So as we start to think about what it takes to do that, we are working through studying the types of scale that we're talking about. Um, not just um, consumer vehicles, but medium and heavy duty trucks. And as we get to, to 2040, 2050, the large passenger truck stop has to be enabled to have roughly 30 gigawatts of power um, to be able to um, charge large scale semi trucks um, in succession all at the same time. And that's an order of magnitude of what is between a small town and a large industrial plant. Um, and if you think about that sprinkled throughout the state on the order of the slides that John just shared, um, it's an enormous undertaking, but we feel that we're up to it and we have to thank our partners in government, both at the federal level, at the state, NIPA and NYSERDA, uh, New York State DOT, New York City DOT. Uh, it's been really fantastic thinking this through. Um, so we, we talked a little bit about a study that we've done um, both with RMI and CalStart um, that, that will talk about the Northeast Freight Corridors Charging Plan. Uh, it's a $1.2 million two-year study um, that will study medium and heavy duty vehicles um, in terms of the charging platform funded by the Department of Energy Vehicle Technologies Office. It will cover 3,000 miles of freight corridors in the Northeast, um, and we will study 100 sites along these corridors as well as electrification um, needs of the Port of New York and New Jersey. And I'll stop there. Look forward to your questions. Thank you, Brian. Wow, that was really great. Um, so much work is going on uh, and through National Grid. 70 plus projects in five and a half years. That's a lot of effort. Really very much appreciate you, you sharing that with us. Thank you. All right, next up, our last speaker is Jen Hensley, Senior Vice President of Corporate Affairs at Con Edison. Jen? Hi, everybody. Um, thanks so much for having me and thanks to the panelists. Um, I am going to um, figure out how to share my screen here. All right. Um, I'm uh, Jen Hensley, Senior Vice President of Corporate Affairs at Con Edison, um, and excited to share with you some of the work we're doing uh, to help enable the clean energy future uh, and the transition to electric vehicles. Um, let me explain a little bit about Con Edison for those who may not be familiar. We um, are the largest investor owned utility in the state, providing um, approximately 3.6 million customers in uh, the five boroughs of New York City and Westchester County with uh, electric service gas to 1.1 million customers. Um, and we have the largest steam distribution system in the United States serving Manhattan. We also have an orange and Rockland utility that you see there in the orange color, um, which provides service to about 300,000 customers in southeastern New York and New Jersey, um, as well as gas to over 1,000 customers. Um, and a little bit about um, sort of the overall impact of Con Edison, just to put it in context, um, the spending that we do annually um, contributes $18.8 .8 billion to the state's economy. 57% um, of our employees are union employees. Um, uh, and we just have a really tremendous impact on the state's, uh, the state's fiscal uh, fiscal environment. And that's something that we're really proud of. We're um, headquartered in New York and we are a part of uh, the state. We're a very integral part of the state. We have a clean energy commitment at Con Edison that really guides and orients a lot of the work that we're doing to enable 
uh, the state's clean energy goals and the electric transition. Um, these are sort of the pillars and each of the pillars is supported by a host of work activities that our 14,000 uh, employees are executing on uh, day in and day out, building the grid of the future, empowering our customers to meet their climate goals, reimagining the gas system to support decarbonization, um, and leading with by reducing our own company's carbon footprint with the buildings uh, and transportation fleets that we manage, and then partnering with stakeholders to really advance policies um, that are going to be needed to get us uh, where the state wants us to go. I want to talk a little bit about building the grid to enable the clean energy future here. Um, this is, you know, we talked a lot about sort of where you plug in and how you plug in your electric vehicles. There has to be, and Brian touched on it, a real infrastructure behind that, um, supporting the distribution capacity that's going to be required um, as we move forward and expand the electrification of transportation as broadly as we're intending to do it. Um, so a little bit about our demand forecast. As we think about New York power needs, um, we are really thinking about changes, real ma major changes in the in the demand and the draw on our system. Um, and so we anticipate up to an 85% increase in electricity use by 2050 as the electrification of transportation and buildings expands in our service territory. And we're going to build that capacity in a timely manner to meet the customer needs. The increase in electric use can be attributed to really widespread electrification of building space heating, building water heating and transportation, as well as the increased heat waves and other environmental considerations that are going to make um, the way that we manage our interior climates um, different going forward. Um, and this is represented by the demand curve you see here. This is from the New York uh, State Independent System Operator. And the solid lines represent the current trends of a typical day in the summer and winter, respectively. The dotted lines represent the anticipated demand 20 years from now. And two things to call your attention to. One is just the dramatic increase in demand um, that I just referenced. Um, and the second is really that we are going to become a winter peaking system, largely due to the heating, um, to, to the electrification of heating systems, but also the increased demand overall for electrification in our daily lives. And so this transition to a winter peaking system will result in a, in a two peak cycle um, which really our electrical system has yet to encounter here. So we're really planning and building um, to make sure that we uh, enable this um, and enable the electrification in a way that maintains the reliability of our system and um, that allows for these, these trend changes um, that we, we believe we're going to see. Um, this graph shows the number of years that, that it's taken for the growth and adoption of various technologies ranging from cell phones um, and the internet to, to microwaves and other things here. Um, and in the thick blue line, you can see really the steep projected adoption curve of electric vehicles. Um, and I think today we are turning a corner and there's an inflection point um, in that curve because of some of the investments and the programs and things that you've heard about in today's session. Um, and with the unprecedented rate of load growth expected, we um, really need to evolve from planning and building the grid in a just-in-time sort of predictable way, which we've been doing for the past um, several decades, into something that really can accommodate um, the pace of growth that we think can fall sort of anywhere along these curve lines. And so being, being able to ensure that the system has the capacity that's needed when it's needed um, when customers want it is really the focus of the investments that Con Edison has been um, proposing and advancing uh, and executing and bringing online for our customers. Um, these are just a couple of those projects. Um, and so um, here you can see we've built new transmission lines within our service territory, uh, our RCC Reliable Clean City Staten Island project um, was, um, was completed to basically enhance transmission through our system to move power where it's being consumed. 
Um, the Reliable Clean Cities Brooklyn project is also underway and we completed one uh, last year in Queens, Rainy to Corona, a Rainy to Corona line. Um, really thinking about how are we moving large, large amounts of power in and around our system as the load, as the load pockets shift and demand increases, particularly in some of the outer boroughs where um, where uh, some of the bus depots and other fleets are, um, and we're looking at the, the increase in electrification of those. The Brooklyn Clean Energy Hub, which we broke ground on last year, um, is really going to be a point of interconnection um, for uh, offshore wind and other clean energy resources, um, and we're going to take those in at the Brooklyn Clean Energy Hub site, which is um, just there in Vinegar Hill, um, and really just immediately push that, that power out um, through our distribution system to the, to the customers that are using it um, throughout the downtown Brooklyn area, which has seen tremendous amount of growth and new demand. Um, and Fox Hill substation is another example um, of the investments that we're making. This is um, uh, this is an important um, uh, component of the reliability of the clean energy that we're distributing. And I think um, there's just a, the, this is just a little bit of an example, some uh, evidence of the activity that's going on on our system, which is really um, very significant compared to the sort of um, growth plan that we've seen in previous decades as we prepare for this transition. Um, and I'll talk a little bit now about supporting New York's uh, electric vehicle goals. You've heard a lot about this, um, these goals um, through the course of today's session. Um, and we are really working to deliver the energy that those um, charging ports are gonna need. Um, if you look here, this is just a, um, some research that was done around sort of um, what people consider to be a purchase barrier um, when they're thinking about EVs. This is probably not surprising to anybody who's uh, joined this session, but running out of power, low availability of charging stations are sort of the biggest um, uh, hurdle that we need to overcome as a state to really hit that demand curve um, that we showed earlier and increase the adoption of electric vehicles broadly. Um, so you, you can see um, the, the research there, and I think we all have had experience with this anecdotally as well. Um, here you're going to see um, uh, some of the charging stations that are available within our service territory. Um, and you know it's it's definitely um, and you can see the sort of density of the uh, of the bubbles there um, and how it plays out. But I think um, really ensuring that people have access to chargers when and where they need them is the thing that's go and and the sort of proliferation and availability is something that's going to be important to getting over some of those um, perceived or real hurdles that people um, are thinking through as they make their own decisions about uh, electrifying their transportation. Um, and we, we have a series of e-mobility programs and initiatives um, that are designed to support a lot of this activity that you've heard about today. And we work in part close partnership um, with all of the rest of the panelists today. Um, but really thinking about light duty, um, power ready program which provides incentives to offset customer and utility side infrastructure costs associated with installing light duty EV chargers. Um, the program has incentivized the installation of more than 6,400 EV plugs with 40% located within one mile of a disadvantaged community, which we think is really important to ensure that the goals of the CLCPA really to bring every New Yorker along in the clean energy transition um, is, a, is a significant focus of ours. Um, we also received authorization recently to more than double that program budget to seven over $700 million through 2025. Um, so that's something that I think is having real positive impacts um, on, the avail on the availability of chargers. Um, medium and heavy duty vehicles pilot. Um, this is providing incentives to offset customer and utility side infrastructure costs associated with installing medium and heavy duty EV chargers for qualifying commercial sites. Um, 
Our Smart Charge commercial program offers predictable cash incentive re revenue streams for charging during off-peak periods and overnight, really as a um, as an effort to kind of shave the peak and and manage um, manage the size of our system that's required to deliver this need. Um, this is the country's first large-scale commercial managed charging program and something that we're really proud of. Um, and then Smart Charge New York, which offers cash incentives to EV drivers for charging their EVs at off-peak times, reducing um, stress on the energy grid and, again, helping us manage um, and shave those peaks. And this is also one of our most successful programs, which has enrolled uh, over 12,000 participants and growing. Um, so we think these are really critical programs to help accelerate the build out of um, charging infrastructure and are things that our, our teams are actively engaged in. When we think about you're seeing school buses here, but when you think about charging stations um, and sort of the coincident load of, you know, this fleet of buses all charging at once um, to get ready for their morning routes, um, you're really looking at um, significant draw on our system. And it, it used to be that, you know, when a when a residential building was going up, we would see plans or get a load letter from a developer, you know, 18 months, two years, three years in advance as they're going through their planning and design phase and, um, and getting ready. And we would be doing the same thing on the energy side. We would be planning the grid, um, assessing our capacity, getting, um, getting our system ready to serve that load so that when those apartments came online, um, we were we were ready to sort of um, flip the switch and give them power. Now, you know, these fast chargers can be installed sometimes in a matter of um, weeks or months. And the draw that they're taking, um, you know, is really significant. And we're looking for, a, you know, a level two charger, I think, um, uh, is going to draw about the equivalent of, you know, nine apartment you know, nine sort of standard New York City apartments. Um, so you're really, um, you're really, I think, transforming the way that we think about what needs to be delivered, when it needs to be delivered, um, and what it's, um, and what the grid needs to be ready for. Um, so those are some of the investments that we're making. And as we think about these investments and the cost of these investments, um, you know, we, we are really focused on affordability for all of our customers and um, making sure that people have um, uh, that that people can continue to afford their bills and that incentives are oriented around the people uh, who need them most and you know just as we think about this electrification trend we think at con edison that it's important to remember as well that um, you know the cost of inaction on these initiatives is not nothing um, there are significant costs that communities pay, that individuals pay, and that our economy pays um, because of our reliance on fossil fuels. And so um, we have been really supportive of this transition um, and, you know, investing heavily in our grid to make sure that we can handle it because we know how important it is um, to the communities we serve, to our customers, um, and, um, and to society at large. Um, and so for Con Ed, um, as we, we are working with a lot of operators, um, providing advisory services, helping think through um, placement and installation of EVs, planning our grid to meet those needs. And we are hoping that folks um, who are interested in installing chargers within our service territory will reach out to us early. Um, we'll be in close coordination with our teams so that we can plan and execute in an efficient, timely, and cost effective way. Um, so this is how you can contact us and definitely look forward to additional um, questions through the session. Wow, great. Thank you, Jen. Oh, my goodness. You shared so much information in just a few minutes. Uh, you, we could easily have had each of our presenters fill an hour. So we really appreciate you taking the time. I was jotting down so many notes while all of you were talking. Uh, it was really great. So thank you again for everyone for sharing this information. So we do have some time recognizing that some folks may need to leave us as we get to one o'clock, but the session is scheduled to go past that. So you're welcome to stick with us and um, share your questions. Also, still time to drop your, your location in the chat, whatever city you might be logging in from or organization. We'd still love to hear that information. 
Uh, now I'm going to introduce Stephanie Brooks. Stephanie, are you there to start walking us yep. through some of these questions? I'm here. My audio great. okay? Yes, great. we can hear you Thank great. You. Thanks. Okay, so uh, we did get some questions early on for the New York Power Authority. Uh, John, uh, first one is um, regarding the charging system. Uh, this charging system looks much like what South SC, uh, sorry, South Dakota uh, DOT has created in Seattle. I am curious or I have, if you benchmarked with Seattle when you created it. We did not. No, we were designing it mostly around like work that Tesla had previously done or Electrify America. Great. Thank you. Another question was, who is responsible for the operations and maintenance of the chargers once they are installed? It's a two-parter. Are you aware of any third-party firms that would manage operations and maintenance on behalf of a host agency? Yeah, there, there are a number of firms doing that kind of work. Um, when we contract out for the design and building of the stations, we also contract for a multi-year service agreement um, and we mandate local factory trained technicians Mm -hmm. uh, and local spare parts, because early in the program, we learned the hard way. We were shipping um, parts from overseas and, and losing weeks of charger downtime and flying technicians all over the world. And that, that was not sustainable. And we also have mandated response times when chargers are down that a technician has to arrive within X number of hours or days, depending on the severity. So that, that that's crucial. and. In the NEBI program, there are uptime requirements for these chargers that, you know, push you to do all that kind of work to make sure the chargers are working as often as possible. Great. Thank you. One more question. Um, how is traffic planning being managed for cases like JFK's DCFC hub? Are you building out for three to four year projections or long term projections as more vehicles become plug in hybrid full electric vehicle? Um, we are not. So basically we designed the program back in 2019 based on what we thought the world would look like today. And I think we actually underestimated a little, like when we built the 10 charger site in JFK, a lot of people were sort of teasing us that it was way overkill. And, and now it's so busy. There's an attendant actually keeping the traffic moving there. It's so busy. Um, and then even some of our upstate sites, uh, we're seeing like usually holiday weekends, there's a queue to charge at like a four charger site. And now we're starting to see that happening on weekdays at some of the busier upstate sites that are like at intersections of multiple roadways. Um, but, you know, our vision was always to be the first mover. So we always thought we're designing this whole thing to be about 10%, somewhere between five and 10% of the state's total need not even knowing exactly what that would be in 2025. And um, the utility you know, regulatory group, the DPS, uh, when they did the make ready order that you know, sort of defines the utility involvement in these projects, um, they set the new target for DC fast charging at 6,300. So our program's 400. So we sort of landed almost exactly between the five and 10% point. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we're really going forward. It's, it's really the private sector that we're hoping jumps in with both feet to build all this out at the scale it needs to be. Great. Excellent. Thank you. Um, a question came during Brian's presentation at national grid. I think could also be answered by anyone here. Uh, how long will it take to charge a truck? I'm assuming a large delivery, you know, 18 wheeler potentially. So that really depends both on the size of the truck itself and the battery and then the speed um, at which the charger uh, draws the power. So with one of the larger uh, 350 chargers, 18-wheeler uh, can charge in a few hours. Hey, and someone just responded um, here in Rockland County, I see a bunch of chargers and never see a waiting line. So potentially uh, to, to your in response to your your response. Um, and these, there's some questions came in as well from Jen at Con Edison. Um, any comments on work being done for electrification of the railroad network? Uh, not, not specifically. I mean, we work a lot with the the MTA on the subway and and their their network, um, which we um, have you know a lot of electric service to. Um, in terms of like freight rail. Um, 
I'm not, I'm not super familiar with that, but can definitely follow up with the team and check. I don't know, Brian, if you um, have anything on that. I, I can jump in. Um, uh, you know, there, there are, there is some movement toward, um, electrification of, uh, some of the, some of the like yard, um, yard, uh, locomotives that, you know, will push, push trains around a, a rail yard. Um, there has not been a whole lot of, uh, movement toward electrifying freight rail at this point. Um, you know, I know that there's been some discussions about electrifying some parts of the MTA and and um, and passenger rail systems that are not electrified to date, although those are major projects that um, I don't think are um, in the in the near term. But, um, you know, most of the most of the emphasis on electrification of rail has been around subways and, and commuter rail and, and some light rail, which isn't really a thing in, in the New York metro area right now, but um, uh, it's starting to creep a little bit into the freight rail, but but just kind of in the discussion phase. Yeah, no, I Thank think you. that's exactly right. Thank you. Awesome, thanks so much for jumping in, um, both of you. Uh, one more question for Jen, please. Um, for uh, what percentage of total vehicle fleet are electric electric vehicles in your 2043-44 projections when you're estimating the peak load? And then the two-parter, uh, you know, if you could sort of estimate the rate between private cars versus trucks versus buses. Yeah, I'll come back with um, specific um, specific percentages, but I think in general we're looking at the requirement, the purchase requirements that are in place in New York State, and kind of projecting um, off of that. So that's um, the genesis. But I can circle back with the um, with the group when I have the the additional details. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, one person would just noted they had a hard stop at one, but that this was wonderful and you, you all were very informative and um, I see no other questions in the chat. If anyone had anything else, um, please yeah, put it in. Tying in um, to Jen's point, I guess it, the, the state has a, a, a mandate, I guess, in 2035 that EV sales up or, or light duty vehicle sales transition over to EV. So, I mean, they'll still be. You know, gas vehicles in the fleet that were, I guess, were purchased in the 2030s, like living out their useful life. But, you know, that's going to determine a lot of that ratio of how many gas cars will still be in the fleet in the, in the 2040s. So it'll be a pretty high ratio of EVs. I'm not sure exactly what the projections are. Right. And, you know, I, I referenced some of the, the regulations around cars and trucks, um, you know, by that period, um, you know, on based on the laws on the books, um, all of the school buses in the state will be um, zero emission. Um, the many of the largest transit operators have committed to being zero emission, including the MTA uh, by that time frame. So most of the transit buses will be zero emission. Um, the regulations around uh, Trucks will should be um, pretty close to 100% of new purchases will be zero emission by that time frame. Uh, I think the the target is 2045 um, at the latest for 100% zero emission truck sales. But as John mentioned, um, that is sales, not total vehicles on the road. And then um, and then for passenger vehicles, um, 2035 is 100% sales. So um, you know, there will still be some, but, but a very large portion of them will be, um, zero emission by then. The, the, the other interesting point of discussion about the NIMTIC region specifically is that 6,300 fast charger, uh, goal, um, is very disproportionate to the NIMTIC region. Um, and, and it has to do with the housing stock that. You know, like our program is is to try to have a lot of dots on the map all throughout the state to allow you know travel across the state or visitors to come in the state. 
but that 6300 fast charger goal is is something very different and it speaks to urban populations and that you know people in apartments may or may not have dedicated parking with low speed charging dc fast charging may be their primary source of charging like somebody who say parks on the street and lives in queens um, might be visiting a fast charger on a weekly basis. So the, the number of fast chargers in the NIMTIC region is, is the vast majority of that 6,300 target. Thank you. Uh, we just got a question about disposal. Uh, what happens to batteries that are past their useful life and cannot be charged? How will they be disposed? I, um, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. So, um, you know, this is a great question, um, something that is a hot topic within the industry. Um, you know, first off, it's important to say that um, a lot of the assumptions about battery life have been underestimates of um, how long batteries are actually going to last in, in useful uh, operation within the vehicle. So, um, when EVs have come out and, and before that, when hybrids came out, there was a lot of concern. Are these batteries going to, you know, uh, be failing after a few years, uh, pretty much across the board. Um, we have seen that the batteries are lasting longer, 100,000, 200,000, you know, sometimes even longer, more miles than, um, than that. Uh, they're all warranted, um, to, I, I think a hundred thousand miles, um, and. Um, so, what, so it, it isn't as I would say, it isn't, um, as much of an acute problem as some people may think, because, uh, the batteries often last a pr approximately the full life of the vehicle. That said, when a vehicle is retired or when a, va a battery needs to be replaced, um, there are a few things that might happen with it. One is that there are uh, companies that are that are getting started um, that are um, and and building capacity that can recycle the batteries because there's still a lot of useful material in the batteries that can be then uh, turned into new batteries. Um, and the second is that uh, sometimes there are a lot of folks who are thinking about these batteries as useful in stationary uh, battery situations. So. Uh, when it may not have enough of a charge to be useful in transportation, it may still have 80% of its, um, you know, capacity remaining, but which is plenty, you know, for, um, a stationary capacity. You just don't want to be lugging around a lot of extra battery weight that you don't, uh, get use, uh, out of in a, in a car or a truck. So, um, companies like, um. Redwood materials and uh, Lycycle um, are starting to do the recycling and and have seen some pretty good um, opportunities and 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 economics for that. But uh, there are also some potential other al reuse alternatives. Excellent, thank you. I believe these are um, all the questions that came through in the chat. Adam, did you have any questions or any more comments? Well, I think I'm going to just wrap us up at this point. We got a really uh, so much information that was shared and it was a little, if anything, maybe a little overwhelming. So I understand if folks didn't, you know, have too many questions. I was uh, jotting down about the TLCPA and the 1.2 trillion in public health benefits and uh, so many lives that are going to be impacted by, by the work that everyone on this panel has been talking about. So. I uh, really appreciated Adam, John, Brian, and Jen taking the time to share all this information with us. I'm sure we will have, we will want to share as much of this information to our attendees as we can. I want to thank the, the NIMTEC team, of course, for putting this together. And uh, for you, all of our um, participants, everybody that logged in to listen in. So uh, we hope we will see you again on May 16th when we hear about Vision Zero in the city of Hoboken. And until then, everyone have a great day. Thank you again. Take care. Thank you. And the link to the CM credit is in the chat if anyone is interested. Thanks, Thanks Stephanie. We have a hand raised. Um, from participant. Manesh, you had your hand raised.
Nope, I guess it was an accident. Okay, <laughs> all good. Thanks. All right, uh, I'm gonna end the meeting now, okay? <laughs>